Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. With me tonight is my colleague, Clayton Jones. The program is brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, pretty much all aspects of law and society, but focusing primarily on drug laws. Uh, we like to consider this to be your show, so if you have a question or a comment, uh, please call us at the number on your screen. If you're not watching the broadcast live, you can email me at the email address on the screen, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible, and we may use your question or comment on the next show. How are you tonight, Clayton? Well, I'm doing good. It's been uh, a long time since the last program, <laughs> yes, and there is just been, I, there's more than we can even talk about okay. in a week. Well, I want to start out and just explode all over uh, an event that happened here locally this weekend. I want to talk about, and this may sound a bit biased or prejudiced, like I don't know all of the facts yet, but I want to talk about what sounds like a game of a large gang of armed muscular thugs going on to the property of a four foot 11 inch woman, beating her up, grabbing her phone, destroying the phone and stealing the memory cube out of it simply because she was using that phone to make a video recording of their actions. Now this group of armed muscular thugs invading her yard were Houston police officers who had just stopped her husband for a traffic offense, wrestled him to the ground, beat him up a little bit, and charged him with resisting arrest. I believe he didn't come to a complete stop at a stop sign. Okay. And he says that he went several hundred yards before he finally stopped. I think the police report said it was almost two miles. So I'm not going to argue about the traffic stop. That may or may not have been legitimate. But for them to have gone on to this woman's yard when she was not in any way interfering with their work, physically taken her phone from her and destroyed it and took the memory chip from it that is strictly an act of sheer, brutal outlawry and should, if the facts are as they've been stated, end up with the perpetrators in prison. The mere fact they were wearing police uniforms in no way justifies that kind of behavior. And I want to say this to all of the policemen out there watching, police officers out there watching. It's beyond any doubt now under the Constitution in this country. It's been upheld by courts all the way up and down the chain that any person in the public who does not physically interfere with your carrying out your duties has an absolutely protected constitutional right to film or record and capture the sound of and the pictures of anything you are doing while you are a police officer serving the public. And for you to interfere with that absolute constitutionally protected right is a severe violation of the Constitution. It's a deprival of civil rights and most often will also be a violation of the state statute regarding assault and battery and probably 
it's a felonious, aggravated assault. So policemen, be aware that any time you're on the job, any person anywhere around you has the right to make and use a video recording of what you're doing and you should conduct yourself accordingly. Do not ever treat a person you are dealing with on the streets or on the roads in any way that you're unwilling to have shown to a federal judge in a federal courtroom where you're the one on trial. Well, I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's starting to become the way things are done. Just like in California, there is a gentleman that just got out of jail last week. Mm -hmm. He's been there for like 15 years. Okay. He had drugs planted on him by the drug task force. Mm -hmm. Now, here is this man. He's going to be paid $150,000. He wasted 15 years of his life. But yet that damn policeman that did this to him will walk the streets and nothing will happen to him. It, we see it time and time again across this country. Okay, uh, shall we start with the story of Dallas? Sure. A few years back. And I've got to admit that the current district attorney in Dallas has been doing a pretty good job about cleaning up the mess and straightening it out. But at that time, the Dallas Narcotics Police were taking drywall, mm -hmm. gypsum board, grinding it up into a power, powder, using paid informants to plant their ground up drywall on people they wanted to arrest and charge with drug possession. And I forget how many people ultimately were turned loose, had charges dismissed, convictions set aside because they had been convicted of having drywall. Some policemen got fired. I don't know that there were any convicted. Uh, I think the, the main thing I want to say here, Clayton, is that if we go back as far as we can go where there was anything <clears throat> like a policeman, if we go back to the time the British gin laws, which were the first modern prohibition laws, were passed in about 1730, there was a real problem there with informers that would turn in a neighbor to get a reward payment and then testify that this neighbor had been selling gin to people. And he would split the award and get reward and get someone else to come in and testify with him. It's it's as oh, that was even a hundred years before the police force was formed. If you go back, you cannot find any time in modern history when there have been police forces when you have not had this kind of corruption. If you remember in Los Angeles less than 10 years ago, there was that big stink with the Ramparts Division right. where in effect almost an entire division of the Los Angeles police was fired because of faked up drug arrests. I think the only thing I can say is that the situation is probably better today than it's been at any time I can remember. Part of it, you ever hear of a guy named Rodney King? Sure he did. Guy that got beat up on the side of the road ended up uh, not being convicted because uh, there just wasn't anything to the police story. Uh, and if you remember his case, 
made the news and he got off because someone living in an apartment next to the scene videotaped the whole thing. If you've been looking at the stuff coming out of the Occupy movement mm -hmm. the past couple of months, what do you see in every city where the Occupy is going on? Cameras. You see video from camera phones. If you look at the state of Texas, and the state of Texas certainly I would not put up as a shining example of good proper law enforcement, but we're good enough now that we have had over 20 capital sentences set aside because people like Project Innocence have forced the state to retest DNA. Mm -hmm. We now have a state created evidence commission who's at least trying to establish some standards. Uh, so I would say that, yeah, things are still bad, but they're not as bad as they were, and things, I believe, are getting better. So what you're saying is that we still have to live with the double standards of uh, law enforcement, that these policemen, and, and, and the one example that got me all up, riled up was a few years back in Pearland, when that Spanish man was walking home mm -hmm. and the two policemen noticed that he was drunk and they jumped on his back and he yeah. was died from uh, asphyxiation and they walked. Um, and I've become just painfully too aware that it's like a double standard. Well, nearly 50 years ago now, 40 years definitely, I was in law school. And in my first year in law school, like all first year law students, I took a class called torts. And the teacher, when we were talking about assaults and similar kinds of, of torts, said that before he started teaching, among his other jobs, he was a police advisor to the Cleveland police force. And his advice to the police force was any time they were working the streets uh, to always carry what he called was a throwdown. And this is a fairly good example of a throwdown. Just a plain old innocent pocket knife. But he said that his advice to the police was, anytime you're working and you hit a guy with your billy club or you shoot him or you get in a scuffle with him, make sure that throwdown ends up on the ground beside him. And then in your report, you saw he had a knife and you defended yourself. I don't know of that kind of advice being given to any police force in the country now. So are we going to clean it up overnight? No. Are things better than they were? I think they are. And I'll also say this, because I've, I've had my rant for the night. The vast majority of police officers are honest, hardworking citizens yes. doing their best to do an impossible job. But how many rotten apples does it take to spoil the barrel? You know, I guess it would be if when they find these people that, just like this man did all these yeah. years, if, if the public found that that policeman got some type of something. Yeah. Uh, I think we'd all feel a little bit better about our police force. We would. One of the problems there, and I don't know that case, but in virtually every crime on the books, we have something called uh, 
a statute of limitations. And if you don't bring a charge against the person within a certain length of time, then you're barred from prosecuting him. And if you just say 15 years or so, the statute's probably run on it. We need to take a break now and we'll carry on from here when we come back. The whole idea of a drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk about. We're going to start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference or whether people Al yeah. Capone didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Hey, drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. Well, on drugs uh, isn't working and that, if anything, is just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. I think the, the Bible is pretty clear that it expects justice and mercy and compassion. And I believe that uh, to start with, and from my uh, work as a criminologist, that the, we, the, the drug, our drug policy falls quite short on the issue of justice, that um, people are unequally treated depended, depending on their ethnicity, their social class, and the Bible contains more than 2,000 scriptures decrying the uh, injustice related to, to poverty, to oppression, to corrupt government. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, we have a caller waiting, and caller, thank you for being patient. Uh, what's your comment or question? Well, the question I was having is that I, I do understand that you mentioned that uh, it only takes a few apples to spoil the rest. But, you know, the, the thing is that um, they won't continue unless the, the systems create uh, or apply rules, you know, strong across those crimes that sometimes are committed by the the police and in some cases that they they are brought up to society because of the media. But other than that, there's some cases that they never get to court and they get away with what they do. Okay, uh, and I've got some things to say about that. Uh, Part of it is that the police, like any other organization, kind of sees itself as a club and protects itself against outsiders. Yes. So the problem is how to let the outsiders into the club. Police, like any other organ of government, needs to be totally transparent. If we look at one thing that has happened, almost all police forces in the United States within the last 10 or 15 years have installed dashboard cameras in their police cars. The better ones are fixed so that any time the officer turns on his flashing lights the camera automatically starts up and videotapes whatever is in front of the car as long as those lights are flashing. Now when those first started appearing across the country, we started getting some pretty outrageous tapes mm -hmm. of police officers going abusing on. drivers, just really going bananas sometimes. 
more and more as those cameras became common and as news editors found they could get access to the tapes, the officers' behavior cleared up. When I was a baby lawyer, 40 years ago again, in the Lubbock Police Station, the detective's offices were on the second floor. The jail lockup was on the ground floor. It was really amazing how many prisoners, while handcuffed, tried to escape from the officers and fell down those stairs and had to be taken to the hospital. The city installed video cameras inside the police station and after the first three or four tapes showed up of policemen helping those guys fall down the stairs, those injuries stopped. Now, the more often the police realize that someone has one of these pointed at them, Anytime they're in public, the more their act is going to clean up. One thing I would like to see, and it's quite technically and economically possible today, is that video equipment has improved to the point where a very small camera could be clipped to the shoulder strap on a policeman's uniform hooked up to a recording device by a little Wi-Fi box on his belt, and every instant he's on duty in uniform could be recorded. And that includes when he's going to the bathroom and when he's eating donuts. Mm -hmm. Now these would be locked up and only the parts released by a court order are necessary for a case would ever be revealed. But if the entire, entire shift were recorded, then I think that we would quickly see improvements. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hey, Buford, this is Dean. Hey, hey so, Dean. Hi, Dean. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to touch base with you guys. Good to see you back again. You're doing yeah. all right, huh? I'm doing good now, yeah. Well, good, good to hear you. Yeah, we're... Uh, I, I think making some kind of progress, um, I, I don't know, maybe not. They say, what was it? First they uh, ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Yeah. And I think there was a situation happened today. President Obama was uh, answering questions posted on YouTube, the most favorite, if you will. Yeah. And the number one question was uh, put together by a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, rated number one by far. And I'm told that they uh, answered question about late night snacks and all kinds of other things, but they totally ignored the number one question, which dealt with uh, the war on marijuana. Well, as I recall, a year or so ago, they had the same sort of website where yeah. the number one question would get answered, and it was about uh, marijuana, and the president just kind of laughed it off. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that holds true across the board. Any yeah. poll, uh, you know, newspapers uh, have stories about uh, drugs or marijuana, yeah. and they put up a poll, would you legalize, do you think, you know, it's time to tax yeah. and regulate all these things? And it always winds up 80, 90 percent in favor of making the change. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, I, I don't know, just it, the public gets it, and apparently these politicians are so afraid to, admit that they also, I think, get it. Well, I think you just said the magic word. The more I look at it, the more I'm seeing that the primary motivating factor for politicians is fear. Yeah. And they're so afraid to take a position that might make anyone vote against them that they're not going to vote to make a change in any direction. Even when they know it's for the good. Even when they know it's for the good. Yeah. And even when they know 
that if they did it, a majority of the people would approve. Well, uh, certainly that's true, and and very few would uh, hold a grudge against them. Yeah. I believe at this point. I mean, even you know, my, my father's passed on now, but I talk to people in their eighties and and nineties, and they have a hard time discussing the subject. But when you bring up a couple of you know known facts yeah. like it's empowering our terrorist enemies or yeah. uh, making sure there's thousands of violent U.S. gangs, they they do get it rather handily. They uh, may not have been alive during the time of alcohol prohibition, or at least not of drinking age, but they remember the stories from their parents, Yeah, how it uh, just didn't pan out the way everyone thought. Well, the funny thing is, in some ways, especially in Texas where prohibition lasted to the 1960s and 70s, the old folks understand what you're talking about a whole lot better than the young people do. Mm -hmm. Oh, heck, I, I remember in high school days people making runs uh, to Oklahoma. Yeah. I Coors beer, Yeah, for God's sake. I mean, you know, it was like a, a drug run, if you will. But, people would gather yeah. their money together in advance, and everyone would be excited. But that, that's a good way to talk to Texans who are over 50 or 60 years old. The oh. ones we have trouble getting through to sometimes are those in their 30s. Well, and and the, the the fact of the matter is we've seen the failure of prohibition. Yeah. I, I you know me. I, I've I've had this question. You know, given the circumstance, you know, we're empowering our terrorist enemies, yeah. given reason for these barbarous cartels in Mexico oh, and yeah. south of their border. Uh, Thirty-five thousand violent U.S. gangs. What is the benefit of this drug war? What offsets all this horrible blowback? And that's the question I want to ask the drug czar. I want to ask somebody <laughs> in a position of power whose uh, lack of credibility, I think, trying to present an answer to that question would yeah. be obvious. Well, well the only thing I got from uh, Walters when he was our, our beloved leader and drug czar was that uh, the one good thing they have done is they've saved a lot of people from becoming heroin addicts. That was his one saving word. And the question is, have they? Have they indeed? I you mean, know, uh, it's like I, saying if we change the laws to allow drugs to be used, the American public, by our politicians, are going to lose all their brains and we're all going to become drug addicts. Mm -hmm. I mean, drugs are cheap, they're good, they're everywhere. I, I think if somebody was going to be a drug addict, there'd be one now, when <laughs> tough times are here. Well, sure, and, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, whether they take out a street corner vendor or they get a, you know, a city uh, distributor, they haven't changed anything. Somebody's going to step into that job. Uh, somebody wants to make that money. Oh, an hour after the guy's gone. Well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with both of you here. I'm going to tell you that almost everyone in this country is a drug addict. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Because the most widely used recreational drug in this country okay. is used by about 90% of the population and about 90% of those that use it are addicted to it and that's caffeine. Yeah. And you, okay. can't, you can't tell me that having a nation addicted to caffeine has destroyed itself. Well, and that's that's the truth. And you know, and then we're also bombarded on a daily basis with all of these commercials of products that are designed yeah. to alleviate some malady, some yeah. you might call minor or more major. I'm not sure, but the fact of the matter is, they now come with warnings that it may lead to this new yeah. new uh, testosterone drug they've yeah. got. It may lead to prostate cancer and all kinds of other things. Uh, they're willing to take that chance of harming the individual, but the great unknown, say of marijuana, they're afraid that somehow it's, it's going to harm a person's health. They've had the, the cycle of hysteria and propaganda for decades about it leads to breast enlargement, it leads to 
chromosome damage. It leads now, to be, all kinds be careful, of things. Dan. Again, coming back to your thought, Buford, that people yeah. should fear. Be careful and now. Fear is their tool. I fear is I, what makes yeah. the drug war work. I don't want you using my show to say that marijuana causes breast enlargement. <laughs> because I don't want to lead all of the teenage girls in the city down the wrong track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. Okay. You know, the whole, I, I wouldn't want to start that. <laughs> oh. so. Well, and, and that's, that's the truth. I mean, yeah. I don't want to, it's, it's hard to even mention some of these things, but it was the wave of hysteria about inhalant abuse that led to the widespread inhalant abuse. It was It was all of these... Uh, waves of media hysteria that alerted kids to the possibility and and led yeah. too many of them to try it. Yeah. You, you know, that huffing stuff has been around forever. When I was in the Marine Corps in uh, Vietnam, we had guys that were doing it uh, on our compound. It, it's been around for years and years and years, and it's been abused for years. Well, and, and too many people have... Uh, Oh, yes. lost their 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 health for, because yeah. of it, whether it be it mental or physical. Certainly. I agree. Well, while we're talking about around for a while, I want you guys to put your thinking caps on. And I also want all the viewers to put their thinking caps on. Because I was thinking just the other day, the Harrison Narcotic Act, 1907. which is our basic drug law, was passed and became effective in 1914. That means its 100th anniversary is coming up in two years. I think we need to get together and plan some sort of way to recognize the 100th anniversary of that marvelous flop. So everybody out there watching, we've got two years. Let's come up with a way to recognize the 100th birthday of the fatal war on drugs. Buford, as I was growing up, you know, I, I was, a, you know, loved studying the Civil War. I think it was the, you know, uh, the 100th anniversary of, of that occurrence yeah. when I was, you know, in, in school. And it was being focused upon, and I read a lot of books about it. And then I heard about, you know, uh, wars that lasted 10 years and 20 yeah. years. And there was, I, one long war was, I think, War of the Roses. And, and then there was one that was called the Hundred Years War. Yeah. And that just struck me as, wow, how can anybody <laughs> do uh, continue an effort yeah. for 100 years? They must have really been fighting over something big. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's a direct analogy, a comparison there with the drug war and the fact that what is it that we're really fighting over? Have we ever stopped one determined kid from getting his hands on drugs? Have we ever stopped the flow? Have we ever done anything it was supposed to do? It's a pipe dream of men who long ago died and uh, it's current adherents just smoke on their dream pipe and pretend yeah. they're doing some sort of good. It's, yeah. it's preposterous. Yep. Okay. Well, one day it'll all end. Well, tell me, have you got any one special coming up on your shows this weekend? You know, it's it's Pledge Drive there at uh, okay. uh, the KPFT outfit, yeah. and uh, I'll be honest, I had, I don't have anybody lined up exactly as yet. I do want to mention that in the past couple of weeks, I'd had uh, the district attorney of Harris County, yeah. uh, Ms. Pat Lycos. Um I had Leonard Pitts. Uh, nationally syndicated oh, column. I, I love his column. Miami so. Herald. Yeah. We were talking about uh, his giving away 50 copies of Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow, yeah. Mass Incarceration yeah. in the Age of Colorblindness. And uh, he's doing that because he's hoping those people will read it and then share it with their elected officials. Yeah. Uh, bring some focus to bear on the absolute bigotry yeah. involved in the uh, application of this drug war. Yeah. No. Pat Lycos was saying the other day that uh, just because we have 37 different municipalities within Harris County, that she couldn't enact uh, the uh, giving citations rather than arrests because it would make too much confusion. 
uh, too much of a checkerboard, and we do have a law professor there. Let's ask his opinion. Yeah. Thank you for. Well, isn't uh, 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 Harris? You County... know. Yeah, there's a bunch of different municipalities in Harris County, but when you come right down to it, there's one municipality in Harris County, and that's Houston. If the mayor, the district attorney, the sheriff, and the chief of police got together, the smaller cities and towns would fall in line pretty quickly. And it's not really that big a deal because Lycos's office is large enough to handle it administratively each of the police forces, cities has its own police force. They're in charge of their own administration. So it costs the district attorney's office a little more paperwork. Big damn deal. Hey, uh, Buford, let me ask you this. These other municipalities, I don't know, Spring Valley, they have their own courts, right? And, and do no, each one of no, these other cities no, have no, that? Or do they depend no. on our courts? Uh, possession, possession of marijuana is either a misdemeanor or a felony, which means it's an offense against the state statutes. They're tried in either the county courts at law if they're misdemeanors or the state district courts if they're felonies. But, but they, does the paperwork all go through Lycos' office? It all goes office? through Lycos' office. Someone may be arrested by the Spring Branch Police Force, may even be held overnight in the Spring Branch local jail. But the paperwork is forwarded to Lycos' office. That person is taken to a county court at county criminal court at law for arraignment, entry of a plea, and having bond set. And that's all handled by Lycos's office. Well, then th that brings it down to the question I'm, I think I'm going to ask her, and that is this. You, meaning Judge Lycos, the DA Lycos, you can say, I refuse to take these type cases. Can she do that? Yeah. To all the municipalities? Yeah, but it, it doesn't, once again, it doesn't even matter. Because if, she, if Houston agrees to go along, her intake people would show up in a county court at law and here would come a Houston resident with a citation. Her intake people would be there, the jailer would call and say, we have someone who's been arrested in Spring Branch, here's the complaint against him. That's all the difference it would make to her office. The cases would be handled exactly the same way. And it would save all kinds of la uh, labor hours of booking people in and... Yeah. Cops could stay on the beat and get those bad guys that are prowling the street. Well, uh, one study I saw years ago suggested that it takes about 15 minutes for a policeman to make a stop and write a citation. Mm -hmm. That it takes about three hours for that same policeman to make a stop, make an arrest, transport the defendant to jail, book him into jail, and write up the report. Well, all of this brings to mind, I, I, would it be advantageous, would it help to swing the cat if I were to talk to the other authorities, the, the uh, other villages and, and other minor cities around Houston? Do they have their own DAs? Do they have their own uh, chiefs of they police? Do, they have so their whose own. opinion could help uh, uh, okay. Sway like okay. this on, on this, the way this works out, each of them has their own mayor, city manager, possibly council members. Each of them has their own police chief, their own police force on misdemeanors, which are the state crimes, including marijuana possession. Under four, right? Yes. All of them are required to use the Harris County District Attorney's Office to handle the legal part of it. The city attorney's office is not involved with them in any way. 
municipal judges are not involved with them in any way unless they're delegated to set bond, and I don't think they are. Well, this sounds like it, it's a puzzle that can be put together here. It can. It can very easily. You know, just like I, she was If you want to know what I think, and this is just as a very suspicious observer, the opposition is not coming from the mayors of the towns. It's not coming from Pat Lycos. It's coming from the police. And the police... And, and the unions. Hell, they didn't even want to stop busting people for under a hundredth of a gram. Okay, and the reason why they, they're objecting to it is that these are their come-on arrests. They're the ones they use since they can't charge anyone with smarting off to a cop. They're the ones they use to twist someone's arm into becoming an informant. They're their ones to use for harass harassment arrest when they think somebody's a bad guy but they can't really prove anything from him, which means they lose all of their power if they lose this arm-twisting ability and just have to write a citation. Yeah. And I suspect that they're yelling at me to take another break, so why don't you tell us where we can find you on the radio dial and we'll have to say goodbye for the evening. Well, fair enough. Yes, uh, uh, my shows air Sunday night on KPFT, which is 90.1 FM, okay. uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. And uh, typically we have judges, congressmen, scientists, doctors, lawyers, authors, prisoners, patients, providers, or priests. And we'll have many of those on this coming <laughs> week's show. I just, okay. uh, a little early in the week, haven't framed it up just yet, but I do appreciate well, uh, the opportunity to... Uh, well, speak to your viewers, and okay. uh, you guys keep up the good work. Let me make a suggestion to you, or a plea. Why don't you see if you can get Ray Hill to talk about my little four foot eleven woman with her video phone? All right. <laughs> I'll talk to Ray. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Thank you, All Dan. Right. Thank you. And uh, do we need to go to a break now? <laughs> some brilliant entrepreneurs came up with the idea of blocking the endocannabinoid in our body to create a new diet drug. The theory being, if cannabis gives people the munchies, then blocking the endocannabinoids would make them lose their appetites. The drug they developed, Ramonabont, did indeed reduce appetite by blocking the endocannabinoid receptors. But data from clinical trials showed that Ramonabont users suffered depression, anxiety, insomnia, and aggressive impulses at twice the rate of subjects given a placebo. Well, Sanofi Aventis, the company that had, had developed and was marketing this agent, did not study people with a history of psychiatric illness or depression before they applied for approval. That was probably a mistake. The EMA did approve it, and the drug's been on the market in Europe for a year, a year and a half by now. And I've, I've sort of said, if there was any real problem with this that was more than just theoretical, we would know. Well, it turns out we do know. And they've, they've suggested now that the risk for this agent is, outweighs the benefit. In one study, there were five suicides among Rabonabont users because, as they discovered, endocannabinoids are also mood regulators with the capacity to make us feel euphoric or, when blocked, depressed. Ramonabont was finally withdrawn from the market in 2008. Researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas reported that mice and Ramonabont developed potentially cancerous polyps at a far higher rate than controls, confirming that endocannabinoids are not only mood regulators, but tumor regulators as well. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, we've had a rather lively evening tonight. Yeah, actually, it's been pretty darn good. Yeah. 
I want to take just a minute or two to talk about my book of the week, and then let's see what you've got that we okay. haven't gotten to yet. Uh, tonight, I've got something that's a little bit different. It's Opium Nation by Farabi Nawa. Uh, now, Miss Nawa is a native Afghani, and when she was nine or ten years old, at the time of the Russian in invasion of Afghanistan, her family came to the United States as refugees. She grew up here, became a correspondent, and in about 2004, went back to Afghanistan as a correspondent. And this book is her reportage of what has happened to Afghani society and focusing largely on what the opium trade and opium farming has done to it. Uh, it's also got a fair mixture of her own memoirs in it. Uh, it's a fascinating book to read about a fascinating woman, and it shows uh, how the opium and heroin world operates from the very bottom of the pile with subsistence farmers growing it and sometimes having to sell their 11 and 12 year old daughters as brides when they can't pay back the opium traders that loan them the money to buy seeds. Uh, so it's, it's really an eye opener. It shows a view of a different world. If, if you really want to see a different side of this rather dismal picture, uh, but one with some hope to it, read Opium Nation. Uh, speaking of that, a while back PBS had a uh, special on was the Dancing Boys of uh, Afghanistan. Yeah. And it touched on exactly that, that yeah. these people, families were having to give up their, their daughters, their sons, mm -hmm. because they couldn't pay a debt. Yeah. Uh, and this, this apparently is a very old traditional way of finance among a lot of the Afghani tribal societies. So that children, especially girls, are treated exactly like items of property. Yes. Uh, a lot of them are either sold or put up as collateral for debts. They're given to the purchaser at about age 12 or 13. They have absolutely no say in the matter. None whatsoever. And one of the surprising things is a lot of these highly moralistic taliban we hear about uh, are quite intrigued by young teenage dancing boys and frequently have uh, a group of them on hand for mm. whatever the occasion calls for. You know, it's a screwy world. <laughs> and we're supposed to be living in the so, uh, very uh, socialized part of it. Uh, but my thing that I came up with this week, I was reading through the internet quite a bit, and I stumbled upon about Calderon coming into office. In 2006, starting the um, drug war down there yeah. to stop the flow of drugs into yeah. our country. And since then, we've had almost 47,000 people killed. You just gave us a sneak preview of the next show because the book I'm planning to review next week is the best thing I've found so far that sets out the history and the dynamics of the drug war within Mexico with particular attention focused on Calderon's term. Now, so. and what struck me was Juarez. Juarez is nothing more than El Paso on the other side of the river. Uh, you'd probably be better off as saying that El Paso is nothing but uh, a, a mole on the skin of Juarez because yes. Juarez is what, three or four times larger? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
since Calderon has come into office, in Juarez alone, there has been over 10,000 people killed in that yeah. one city alone. Yeah. <laughs> and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. No. Absolutely not, because every time we hear of one cartel leader or somebody getting captured, there's somebody else in this place the very next day. It's like operations hasn't even stopped. No, no. Uh, and they're, they're not going to stop as long as they're getting the kind of outrageous money that's available for them. And the drugs are cheaper, more pure, yes. mm -hmm. more available. Yeah. Um, all these people are being killed. And, 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 and you know, the thing is, well, there's an easy way to stop it is just by changing the laws in this country because we are the ones that make the demand. If, if we changed our drug laws, we could cut probably $30 billion a year out of the Mexican cartel's hands. Mm -hmm. Now, $30 billion a year buys a lot of guns and grenades and rocket launchers and pays a lot of soldiers to carry those guns and shoot other people. So if we took that money out of the hands, it would be harder for them to fight, and they wouldn't have nearly as much to fight over. But that war in Mexico extends back more or less without cease to at least the revolution of 1910 and to some extent back even as far as the 1870s when they kicked the French emperor out. So there has been a low grade continuing civil war and to some extent a gang structure in Mexico all along. Mm -hmm. But the difference between it and the difference that's caused by the American drug money is the difference between one of those little bitty single sugar ants you might see going across your kitchen cabinet mm -hmm. and a great big nest of fire ants out in the backyard that will eat you alive. You know, when I lived in Mexico, I lived in Mexico from uh, 95 to 99. Okay. And there was this one place I used to go to get my truck washed all the time. Yeah. And you knew, this is back in the 90s, yeah. you knew who the drug people were. Yeah. Because they were the ones that were packing the gun and they drove the nicest car. Yeah. Well, one thing that surprised me when I started really digging into it, uh, one of the early leaders in one of the cartels that's big in Juarez is, was a woman who got her start with the same gang smuggling prohibited liquor into the United States in the 1920s. And they continued running <coughs> liquor into dry Texas during the 40s and 50s. And they were in on the heroin that started coming into this country during World War II. Mm -hmm. So. You know, with our demand, I don't understand why we have to go to these other countries to destroy them when, if we would just work on our demand process, it would help. Well, uh, demand we need to look at, but there's also something else. Historically, we know that opium poppies have been grown commercially in the United States in at least Connecticut, Florida, Arizona, California. We know that Coca-Cola had an experimental cocaine plantation in Hawaii for many years. And there are several other places in the U.S. that has coca-friendly environments as well. Uh, you know, 
the whole idea of prohibition is silly. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why coca or poppies or marijuana should be any more harmful or any particularly different from any other crop farm crop than cotton or corn. I agree. So. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, <laughs> I think marijuana is way too expensive, and uh, <laughs> I'm tired of paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, you've heard my broccoli arguments. And so. I think that uh, we should bring all, all our producers to your your. your your theory, and let them start charging at uh, broccoli prices. Okay. <coughs> well, do you have any last things you want to say before no, we say that goodbye pretty tonight? Much covers it. Um, uh, that pretty well much covers everything I had tonight, except uh, Missouri. Okay. Uh, Washington is the only state with it on the ballot. Correct. Uh, the way I understand it right now, the legalized marijuana ballot proposition has approved signatures in Washington. Yes. California, Colorado, Michigan, and Missouri all have the wording of referenda approved and have scheduled signature collections in those states. And Oregon also. Oregon also, okay. Um, so that's six states where it'll be up this, this November. You know, the pathetic part is if we could start getting a heck of a lot more participation right here in this state, yeah. we could be doing the same damn thing. No, things. we can't. Why? Because Texas does not allow uh, ballot initiatives. Well, if the people got involved and people started to demand from our legislators okay. what we actually wanted, we could change it. Okay. Well, I've got something I want to say about that, but stay tuned for the next show when I come up with my idea of how to influence voters. You know, I usually end with urging you to write your representatives, let your views be known. Today, I want to focus it and tell you to write or call your mayor your city council members, your chief of police, and tell them that you want video cameras focused on the cops every minute they're at work. That government should always operate fully within the public eye. And don't forget to write that representative or that congressman or that senator while you're at it. And in the meantime, we'll dig up some more stuff to talk about <laughs> and see you in two weeks. Good night and thank you. Good. We have these private prisons that have now hired lobbyists to go get minimum mandatory that you. Uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple, damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do, is end the war on drugs.